Good evening, and welcome to Woman. I have a very special guest this evening. She is Elsa Dorfman. Elsa is a photographer who lives and works in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She is the author of Elsa's House Book, a woman's photo journal. She was a Radcliffe Fellow from 1972 to 1974. Elsa has many interesting insights. Welcome to Woman. Thank you, Sandy. Elsa, could we so see some examples of your work? Sure. This is a picture of Anne Sexton that I took um, about a month before she died. I took it in her house in her studio where she worked. That must have been interesting because she was also a Radcliffe Fellow, right? Right, and, and she, was, I, she really liked photographers and we got along very well and she was in a very good mood and um, it worked out very nicely and she let me really do whatever I wanted and was very cooperative and we sat and talked the whole time. What else do you have? And this is Jessie Bernard, who's been on the program. Right. It's very nice. Thank you. And these are friends. They're identical twins. And I took it in the kitchen of Beverly Corbett, who's a friend of mine. Did you pose that? No. They were just talking to each other. And I happened to bring my camera to the party, and I just snapped it. So um, there's a painting behind them, which is why it looks sort of romantic. What do you have next? And this is Winnie Lawrence, who's a welfare rights organizer in Boston, and I took that for an underground newspaper. And it's probably my best picture, I think. It's wild. It's incredible. And I only got $10 for taking two pictures, and I had no idea where I was going, so I think it's a good example of how you never know where you'll get your best picture. Elsa, I think one of the amazing things about you is that you never picked up a camera until you were 28 years old. And I didn't. And I went to Europe for my junior year, and my mother pleaded with me to take pictures. And she said, we're spending all this money. Send us pictures. And now when I think of it, I could shoot myself, because Paris has really changed. But when I was 28, I was working at this um, place where we developed elementary school equipment and stuff. I'd already been an elementary school teacher in 1962 and was um, a failure because I wore knee socks. I couldn't get my kids to salute the flag by 8.30, and I forgot to put under God in the salute because they had changed it since we'd been in elementary school. So I was a failure at that. And so um, I was working at this place that made materials for teachers, and I did some of the testing. So I was photographed. So I think that's sort of prepped me for photography and the photographer there gave me a camera and showed me how to use it and I loved it and I was desperate for something to do and I just decided I was a photographer I announced it to everybody it felt comfortable and mostly I was desperate and photography is easy I think so um, there are a lot of people that would just flip by you saying photography is easy I mean it's so mechanized and I know, but you really can learn everything that you need to know about a camera in certainly in a week. And then it's just doing it. It's not like deciding you're going to write a symphony. It really is easy. It's so accessible. I think that's why it's such a folk art. Well, when you started, did you think, I'm going to have a career now, or I'm just going to take some pictures? Or, or what were you thinking? What was well, going through your head? Well, I, I decided I was going to have a career. I, I was immediately? Immediately. Well, because um, this was, um, n it was so embarrassing not to be anything. I wasn't married, and I wasn't like doing anything. So you had to be called something. I mean, when people said, what are you doing? And in, in those days, it was mortifying not to, be, not to be married. I mean, so I had to have a thing. So what could be better? My camera. <laughs> I'm a photographer. People stopped short, you know, and it was uh, like saying you were a poet. I mean, I think that if I had decided to be a poet, it would have been served the same purpose. I grabbed it. Um, and I was lucky because I grabbed it and it worked. I mean, it could have been that I grabbed it and it was a catastrophe. But in fact, it felt good and it was so much fun. And, and it's very immediate photography. Um, you don't have to put in a long apprenticeship. Um, I don't feel that that sort of like knocks what I do because I say that it's easy. Um, it is. It's really easy. Um, How did your parents respond? I mean, they'd spend a lot of money educating you. You should have heard that. I'm sure my mother will say that. You know, I mean, she said that a thousand times. After all those years of college, you had to be a photographer. Whoever heard that was as bad as not being married. 
you know, I'd done it again. But um, yeah. now she's, you know, very proud. But, oh, in those first years, she couldn't understand what I was doing. And, um, and I, you know, I didn't make much money at it, so it wasn't the kind of thing that she could, uh, you know, that there was a lot of money attached to it. Is it true that your photographs are unique because you, you don't retouch them? Um, I guess so. There are a lot of photographers who don't retouch, but I don't, you know, I don't at all. I don't sort of make a religion out of it, but I've just never gotten into it. Um, so I guess that is something. I think that another thing that's unique is that I'm not afraid to say it's easy or to just take them, and I don't sort of make a big deal out of taking them. I mean, they're only photographs, and I think that um, since men have infiltrated photography and come into photography and sort of dominate photography, it's bad form to say it's easy or it's just photography, and you sort of have to um, pad it up and, well, photography is a very important art and all that stuff, but in fact, you know, I do take them and I don't touch them up. How do you describe what you do? I mean, do you think about it a lot? It has a very special quality to it. Um, well, I think about it all the time, but it's the kind of thinking about that's just always going on in my unconscious, and I'm always thinking about my work and how I want to pull my work together and what I want it to be and the form I want it to take. And I do that all the time, when I'm sitting around or talking or in the morning cleaning up and stuff. But when the minute comes to taking the picture, I'm not thinking about that at all. And it's sort of like a reservoir that's in me that's operating, but I'm not thinking about it when I actually have the camera in my hand. I'm really guided by my unconscious. It sounds sort of mystical, but I think I take my best pictures when I'm not my head isn't cluttered with other things. So what you've done is really you've created something for yourself outside of the system. I mean, you obviously, yeah. your teaching didn't work yeah. out if you couldn't uh, yeah. get that together. I really did. I just, um, I hated the idea of being unhappy and, and sort of the idea of being depressed. And um, there was only sort of one thing to do, and that was to do something. And I was uh, um, lucky in the way to find a camera and find it accessible and to do it and to like it. And it really suited my temperament because I'm very social and you go out in the world and you take pictures. And um, I think because I like to read and I have such literary, I had always wanted to be a writer. So being so literary, I could put it together. So um, it worked. I you know, really feel very grateful that it, that it worked. I, I get the feeling that you'd like to turn all women onto photography. It's terrific. I think you learn a lot about your life with photography. It's a great way of documenting. It's own, photography is only like 150 years old. So there are only like four generations who can look at pictures and keep track of their lives and see what they look like as babies. I mean, like our great-grandparents had no ideas. So there's all this personal history that's involved in photography. And I find that um, when I feel down or just want an adventure, going out with my camera really turns me on and turns other people on. They love to have the picture taken. And um, I myself am very urban and don't respond to the woods and stuff, but I know that a lot of people get pleasure taking beautiful pictures of trees and leaves and rocks. And so I think that really is available. I mean, I like to take pictures of people's living rooms. I've, I hear about people with a great living room, and I go running. <laughs> really. I love it to take living rooms and um, chairs, uh, mirrors. I love the mirrors, <coughs> to take pictures of mirrors. So I get all this pleasure, and I think that a lot of women could, because um, it, it's fun and it's easy and accessible. The only thing is it is expensive. That's can you support yourself doing it? Though? No, I can't. I really can't. I support myself by indexing books. I think that um, that if I were a hustler, I think that probably I could. But I just don't have the adrenaline for it, and I don't want to. Also, I don't want to become a business like Elsa Dorfman Inc. by mitzvahs, weddings, and births. <laughs> 
I just, I just wouldn't be able to do the bookkeeping. So this is sort of perfect because it's a real way of sort of being a quote artist and having sort of an offbeat life and getting work done and having adventures and inventing sort of a way of living that's comfortable. I mean, I have fantasies of Margaret Bourke White, but I just don't have the organization for that. You're about to start a project in which you're going to do a series on women. Yes, I, I'm really attracted to women. I always had a lot of aunts that I liked and my grandmothers, and I have my mother and my two sisters. So um, I've been taking pictures of women for a long time, and now I'm going to pull them together and put them. L let's take a look at some more. Okay. This is my friend Javi Silverglade's grandmother, Lily Silverglade. We took her in Miami. She's 84, and she's just going to the beauty parlor, where she goes every Saturday in the broiling heat. And this is, Nikki, this is Nikki Giovanni, and I took her at home about three years ago. That's lovely. Yes, that, that was really good. And this is a woman, Genevieve Bona, who, I, who stopped me in my car at a red light and asked me if I'd give her a ride home. And luckily, I had my camera with me, and I asked her if I could take her picture, and she really couldn't refuse since I'd given her a ride home. And I could only take two. <laughs> and it was a miracle. I mean, I don't sort of, it was a miracle. And it came out, it came out, it could very easily not have come out. And um, this woman is Lulu Afriki, and she's about 19. And I just was walking in the Harvard Square one Sunday. And again, I just, I don't always carry my camera, but I happen to have it. And um, I asked her if I could take her picture. And, she said, sure. So um, there are really a million images out there on the street. And if I carried my camera with me all the time, I would be able to take a picture every day, almost every hour. But I, but I sort of relax more than that. And I just mentioned it to encourage to tell people that it's out there. And you, you, it really does open up the world. What do you think we should use photography, photography for, ideally? Well, um, I like using it as a way of getting into the world and finding out what's out there and making life more manageable. But I think it's, you learn a lot by keeping track of your own life and how people change. And photographs that you don't think is so valuable now to you really take on meaning with time. I think that time is really like a built-in part of a photograph, that it takes on a quality as time goes by and that it's wrong to throw out old photographs because, in fact, they take on a quality as time goes by that they don't have immediately. So I think it's a good sort of tracking of one's own life. It's history. Um, it's a one, of your, one of your future projects is you're taking an inventory of all the objects in your house. Yes, now that's really... Um, a good example of I'm terribly disorganized and I cannot stand being disorganized. I mean, when I say I'm disorganized, you have to step over things in my house. And I'm not, the floor is like a mosaic of things. And I can't stand it. And I have enough sort of, my mother was such a good housekeeper, that Jewish housekeeper overload, that I feel so guilty. So I think if I took a picture of everything, that would help me organize my life. That's sort of like a very pragmatic sort of, but it will be fun and I'll get good pictures and I may be able to write something that will be fun. So it's serving all the purposes really that photography can serve. It's being sort of like therapeutic. It's sort of like a quote creative exercise to sort of put control in my life. I think photography is very good that way because you're controlling your environment when you're taking a picture. So um, I think when I get through my bedroom, <laughs> it'll be a mirror. I probably have a thousand things in my bedroom. I mean, I bet everybody does. I mean, I have no idea of the number, but hairpins and... So you really are going to take photographs of everything? Everything, everything, everything. And I'm sure I'll throw out a lot of stuff, I mean, I'll say. I mean, I have trinkets. I have a piggy bank that somebody gave me in 1960 that I've been carrying from apartment to apartment. So I, you know, I think I'll 
you know, that one of the effects would be that I'll throw away a lot of stuff. And my mother's always buying bargains, and I have bathrobes, hundreds of, not hundreds, but, you know, 20 bathrobes that my mother has give, bought for me. And, um, you know, if I have to take a picture of each one of those, you can be sure that I'm going to... And, uh, one of the things you don't like to do is manipulate your photographs. The, yes, I, I wish you would tell a story about the Anne Sexton photograph and how you just wouldn't manipulate that photograph. Sure. Can we switch back to it? I um, no, I think we'd probably better not. Good uh, not. Well, in, in Anne Sexton's den, she had a picture on the mantle of Sylvia Plath, who had been a friend of hers, and who she had all kinds of mixed feelings about, and I would say that she was sort of competitive with. And um, it was on the mantle, and it was really tempting to take a picture of Anne and sort of like the picture like that would be like a great little riddle to the world. But um, she never went near the mantle in, that, in a way that would make a good picture, and I wouldn't dream of asking her, although I, there's no question that if I asked her, she would have done it. But um, I would never dream of doing anything like that. And, um, I. I tend to sort of um, let the people sort of unwind, or so, not so much unwind as unfold, and um, whatever happens, happens, and not be manipulative. Um, there have been a few times when I was stupid about it, like Lillian Hellman, who I adore. I was very excited when I took her picture, and she was sitting in front of a window. And I was too excited and too nervous and too everything to ask her to move. And of course, none of the pictures came out. And they're, they're just washed in line. I mean, the one thing is you, it's hard to take pictures of people in front of windows. And I could just um, shoot myself to this day. I was so excited and she had the most marvelous time. And I dedicated the house book to her. I just think she's marvelous. And, and she never said anything awful to me either about ruin. I mean, she spent a whole afternoon in it. Elsa, do you think the camera tells the truth? Absolutely not. I mean, it absolutely. But, we, but we're all afraid of that, aren't we? I know, because you think, oh, God, is that what I look like? Or, um, but the camera and how it can sort of select, I mean, even the picture of Ann Sexton, or you're isolating what you take. And since we live sort of everything is a continuum and we're responding to sort of like a pattern of what's happening, like a river, um, and the picture is like a drop of water that you've taken out of the river to look at on, under a microscope. I absolutely don't think it's real. I have pictures. You know, you can take 20 pictures in, in, in two minutes, and they're so different. Um, I think it's just, it's the, I mean, that's what I love about it. It's not real at all. I have a quote from you, and I, I don't know if you know that I have this or not, no. and you can uh, disavow all knowledge of <laughs> it if you like, but you said, my life is an antidepressant strategy. Yes, oh, well, I re that's what I mean about going out with the camera and having an adventure and, um, and doing something, and I think that's why I announced that I was a photographer. It felt right, and I really needed something. and. Um, and I, I believe it all. I think everything I do is an antidepressant strategy. The inventory is an antidepressant because it really depresses me that my house is messy. But I don't know how to cope with it. So my, I, my way, I'm a photographer, coping about it, with it is if I take a picture of everything and I put it in a book, I'll have a picture of everything. That'll help me organize it. I mean, I have no idea like how many cups I have. And there's a cup here, and there's a cup here. And it would be different if I, if I didn't mind it. But, I, but I'm that sort of anomaly. I can't stand it. But on the other hand, I'm not frantically putting all the cups in the cupboard. I mean, it's, I mean, so I figure, I mean, I, I'm sure that there are people that know how many, how many pair of underpants they have. I have no idea. I have. You know, you could ask, I have no idea how many anything I have. I have like five scissors because I'm always looking for scissors. So I, so it is, it's an antidepressant. Um, you once did a rather outrageous thing, out outrageous to your fellow photographers anyway. Uh, you took a cart and you went into Harvard Square. I'd, I'd love you to tell about that. Okay, and that's, 
and that sort of fits in with this whole thing about what antidepressant, because that was the time, it was just before Christmas, about three years ago, and I was sort of at loose ends, because working in the arts is really very lonely. And, you know, I mean, like today is really terrific uh, talking to you about my work, but basically I'm at home working by myself, taking pictures, and nobody's fainting with delight in front of them. You know, it's... And I was, it was sort of Christmas, which I think a lot of people get down around that time. And I just needed something. So I had all these photographs lying around the house, and I put them in plastic bags, and I made this big sign I had made by a delicatessen sign maker. And it said, Elsa Dorfman Photographs, Singular Opportunity. And it said, Fellow Radcliffe Institute, which made everybody pass out at Radcliffe, which I loved. And, and it said, first year I sold them for $2.50. And I put them in plastic $2 bags and 50 cents. cents. It was incredible. It was incredible. And I ha talked the supermarket into letting me borrow one of the supermarket wagons. And I went to Harvard Square and I sold my photographs. I just said, photographs. <laughs> they thought I was crazy. They'd say, <laughs> um, two fifty for a photograph. I can get mine done at the drugstore. It was terrific because I got all kinds of attitudes. There were the people who knew my work who grabbed them up because they were such a bargain. And there were photographers who came by and said, you're doing a terrible thing to photography. You're ruining photography. And then there were the purists who said, you shouldn't put archive photographs next to plastic. And then there were the people who would come by and would say, who would buy a photograph? Because photography is sort of at the ladder of um, down at the bottom in the artwork. Um, you once had a rather unusual request. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, well, um, this uh, person who's now my friend uh, asked me if I would take a picture of him and his wife making love. And um, I was really sort of hesitant. Um, I, I was terrified. I'd never done anything like that. I'd never seen anybody else making love. I, I was sort of naive. When I told that to a Harvard sophomore, a sophomore, I said, no, I'd never seen anybody making love. And I was terrified and he looked at me and he said you never saw it <laughs> you know? so that was really for me quite a shock and um, but I needed the money and my friends who I really expected to say oh don't do that it's too freaky you might get murdered you don't know what's gonna happen blackmailed I'll said, do it do it my really sane friends so I did it and um, I was depressed when I first did it, but once I developed the film, I wasn't depressed. And um, sort of like the Ian Sexton photographs and not being manipulative, I sort of stood at the edge of the rug. We went to these to men and women's house in New Hampshire, and I just really, I stood behind my camera like this, and I didn't move. I didn't look. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't move my head. I didn't. And <laughs> Would it be different now? No, I think I'd probably be more gamey. Yeah. I'd move around and I have different ideas of what I would do. Um, do you think that women take photographs of women differently, especially nude women? Oh, yeah. Oh, no question. I think they do. I, um, I, yeah, this, they just do. I mean, men look at women, especially a, a naked woman, differently. I mean, they look at them as a piece. What a... Whereas I don't think that women do. In the first place, women are just aren't curious about the things about a woman's body that men are curious about. And um, we were looking at a nude photograph the other day, and you told right. me now if a woman, if a man had taken that, he would have focused on right. it differently. Right, right. It's just what they're curious about. Our bodies is really different. Um, it's just different. In fact, you don't see, see yet women are just beginning to sort of parody taking pictures of men the way men take pictures of women. You know, sort of um, where what's, I mean, when a, usually when a man takes a picture of a woman, he's in sort of like, as a, I hate to so try to say sex object, but he's interested in the machinery sort of. Um, the way men take pictures of cars is the way they take pictures of women. Just like our car advertisements, they're all sort of the same. And now women are sort of beginning to treat men 
some women photographers, but it's very hard to do because we're not programmed to look at men's bodies that way. Taking pictures of men as pure, quote, pieces. Like, what a, what a piece of man. I mean, I myself just never think like that. So it's a real, I have to really consciously try and do that. But, um, oh, there's no question that men take different pictures. So then there is a feminine perspective, you think? Certainly in terms of taking pictures of women. I think there has to be because um, if you really believe that um, people act on their, their creative work comes out of themselves and who they are and what's going on in their head and their history and their obsessions, women have different obsessions and life experiences than men, so there really has to be, I think. It's a question that you can go on into the night asking, and people are really talking about it now. But I, I think that, um, that there probably is. I mean, it's very individual. Like there's an Elsa Dorfman camera, you know what I mean? And, and if you had a camera, there'd be a Sandy Elk, and, you know, and we're women. And if we were men, maybe we'd have a different, you know. So it's hard. It's one of those philosophical questions. Do you think there can be pornography for women, just very quickly? Yeah, but I think I, I think it's sort of like women are too uptight. It's really hard to be creative about it. The men have had thousands of years. Elsa, we've got about 10 seconds left. Let's take a quick look at the last couple of photographs. <laughs> 